Hey guys, how you doing? We made it to yet another Wednesday. So cool to see you. We have such a treat today. I am so excited. The incredible Steve Leahy, one of the best artists out there right now. I mean, before, <laughs> in the future, he's just amazing. And we have an, a live interview with him today. We're going to ask some questions that normally he doesn't get in, let's say, magazines or online. I want to get a different side of Steve, uh, talk about some of his background, make, what makes him tick as an artist. Those different questions, I feel, are really going to be great. And Steve Leahy, he's here. So before, he's, before we bring him on, I want to do a little uh, talk about him. And, you know, I'm telling you, it's I can go on just for a very long time talking about Steve. Uh, he is a graduate of University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth, Bachelor's of Fine Art. Here's some of his acc accolades I found on his website. So he was, uh, this is some of his publications, How Airbrush's Work, author Wolfgang Publications, Airbrush 101. He was the contributing author of that. Uh, he was the contributing writer of Airbrush Magazine and the artwork of Steve Leahy. So very, very exciting stuff. So, and also let's go ahead and let's check out some of his artwork on his website. So we get a sort of a background of this incredible, incredible modern, modern artist with ties to tradition. And also he makes these things sort of come to life in the sense that it has the linear quality of, of time in the sense that his work is connected, I feel, to the great artists of the past. You know, Vermeer, Rembrandt, uh, 19th century French academics. So anyway, let's go ahead and check out some of his artwork. So I'm gonna share the screen now. Let's see. We'll go here and uh, let's see. Okay, so this is Steve's, this right here is uh, Steve Leahy's, uh, let me see if I can make that bigger. Okay, yeah, so here is Steve's website, and here's just a few of his paintings, and I'm just going to bring some of them up. So look at the, this piece right here. Believe it or not, it is three by four inches, which is really incredible, the amount of detail. I'm sorry I can't make it bigger. Uh, this one is called Alchemy, and it's from 2016, and it is on three by four inches. That's how big the painting is. Let me see if I can. Oh, this one right here is one of my favorites. It's uh, This is like one of his cityscape paintings, and this is actually four by three inches, which is absolutely amazing. So you can see just... You know, the incredible detail that he can get in such a small, small format is just incredible. And he does this with the airbrush, believe it or not. And I want you to see this painting. This, this right here is, to me, as far as landscapes, this is definitely rivals anything that you would see in an art museum. I mean, just incredible. It's, uh, this is called Golden. Uh, now I know, I know in in New England you guys uh, say things differently, but uh, Golden Yarmouth, and this is eight point one eight by five inches, which is just stunning. So, uh, so that is basically where we are right now. Just can give you a, a very brief. Uh, rundown or, or brief synopsis and very brief to encompass it encompass an artist like this in just a few minutes is really you know not enough so okay so let's go ahead and bring so first I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna bring in mr. Leahy here he is 
Hey, Steve, how's it going? Hey, Tim, what's happening? Uh, just thank you so much for coming to my live stream, my little baby live stream, and, you know, gracing us with your artistic knowledge and inspiration. I'm really excited. I'm here all the time anyway, so this works out good. <laughs> you weren't doing anything, right? No, no. <laughs> uh, it's, it's great to see you. And uh, uh, so just before we start with the interview, could you tell us about your Monday live streams every week? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Monday live streams have been great. I needed a way to... Uh, everyone always said you have to have a blog on your website. It, it just it just helps people understand what you're doing and, um, you know, gives people back background and kind of like just lets people kind of into your studio. But I don't do well with sitting down and writing all the time. So the live streams are great. It just lets me have that open studio. It lets me talk about the art. It lets me show new stuff. Um, so that's really how it came came about. And then it just turned out to be a blast. I mean, I, it's my favorite night of the week, and it just took on a life of its own. Favorite night right next to Wednesday? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the Greatest American Heroes is on on Wednesday. So I, never I thought it. that was it. Yes, yeah, that was a good show, good. by the way. <laughs> but I, I enjoy that every week, you know, is a, I really like the uh, informal atmosphere that yeah, happens over part, there, man. which is really good. But I'll tell you, that's, I don't think I would have went to art school if that was going on when I was Same. 18 years old, because yeah, I learned no so was, much there, you know? Yeah, no one was doing that. No, you know? no. Well, no one, the technology when I was young, you're much younger than me. Oh, um, I don't know. About that. <laughs> but um, I have to give props to Kent, Kent Lind, your guest last time. Yes. Um, because I used to watch his live streams when he was on Periscope. So there was oh, a little, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I used to watch his live streams all the time. And that's really what got me into it. And even farther back than that, Mike Learn. Um, we used to have open studios on online too, way back. So watching all those kind of kind of got things going for me too. Wow! So you were inspired by their early live streams? Yes, definitely. definitely. Wow! Wow! So you ever? So uh, what was uh, let's say a funny behind the scenes moment in one of your live streams? If you can think of one. Oh, most of them are on the live stream. So. <laughs> Pretty much everything that happens on the live stream happens off the live stream, too. So, no, I think it's been pretty tame. You guys oh, have seen the worst. Yeah, you haven't had any hecklers yet. Uh, I think the entire group of people who show up are hecklers, which is what I love. So, <laughs> yeah. That's oh, very yeah. cool. Very cool. Yeah, great. So I have a couple of questions, uh, yeah. you know, that have to do with airbrush. Uh, yeah. The first one, you know, and then this is like a standard question. You're going to be answered with every every interview. What brought you to the airbrush? All right. So I was really fortunate. When I was in school, uh, I was an undergrad um, in the late 80s. So my uh, degree was in, uh, my major was illustration. So to be an illustration major in the 80s meant you were looking at artwork like Mark Fredrickson and Michael Casey and all these these all these artists were just like monsters and the one thing that I gravitated to with their work was was the way that they all had had kind of a certain feel to it that that's really slick and polished kind of kind of feel and uh, the one common thing that all these artists had was that they use a the airbrush wow. so that's really how I got into it and I was fortunate and also not so fortunate because as I was going through school, things are transferring over to uh, computers. Oh, so yes. I, was, I was there just at the right time to be introduced to the airbrush. And then I just kind of stuck with it when everything else kind of moved over to the computer. So that's how yeah. it happened. We're kind of like the same age in the sense um, we were at the very end of straight traditional art without having computer being like, a larger part of it. I know yes. there were some computer classes we had, but yep. nothing like today. There was no such thing as a Photoshop or a Corel Draw or anything like that. Right, right, exactly. Um, 
So we were actually kind of fortunate to get under the gun, right? Oh, I, yeah. I don't know that I would have. I certainly wouldn't have picked up an airbrush if I was a painting major, you know? It was yeah. being that in the illustration program that really got me into it. Wow. Well, and so you, you grew up in the Boston area, right? I did. So I have a question here about that. And let's see. So let's see this here. So nope, that's not it. Here we go. So growing up in the Boston area, the home of some of the most amazing fine art museums, such as the Boston Museum of Art, the Fog Art Museum, yeah. Isabella Stewart Garden Museum. How and, and has this shaped your art today? It didn't happen until after school. Um, I was I, I lived kind of an artistic sheltered life. You know, I just kind of did what I did. And yes. it wasn't until I, I went to school where I was exposed to this, where you had to take art history. So yes. that was really when the, the shift changed. And while I was in school was when the Gardner Museum was the big Gardner Museum heist. Yes. So that was obviously big news. And one of the paintings stolen was a Vermeer. And that's really how I got into Vermeer. I, the news, it was all over the news. I saw the painting that was stolen and it was, it, it really got me hooked on him. It was, yes. so that's really how, how that happened. So yeah, so my, my involvement with the museums in, in the area really didn't happen till, till college. Oh yeah, so that actually brings me to another question. I did have it here. Let me see if it's, if it's here. Uh, so basically, I remember asking you on one of your live streams that one of your favorite artists was Johannes Vermeer. Yeah. And Johannes Vermeer, as long as the other, as well as the other Dutch painters from the 17th century, uh, uh, John Steen is one of them. And uh, they worked very small in scale. Did that have anything to do with you going small in scale? No, Vermeer was more the light with me, oh, yes. the impact of new light. As far as me working small, that started as a more out of necessity. We didn't have a whole bunch of money growing up. So you were basically drawn on whatever you could. Yes. And generally it was smaller than eight and a half by 11. And that just, that just stuck with me. It just, it's a comfortable size. And I remember fighting with my painting instructors all through school. Everyone was doing these big two by three foot paintings and all my canvases were eight by 10 inches. So. <laughs> I got a lot of flack for that, but uh, but it's just a really, I don't know why, but it's just a really comfortable size for me. It's just, um, I don't know, I, I feel really in control when I'm working on stuff like that. I also like working small and I'm, you know, I was, you know, in the fine art world for a long time before I came into the airbrush world. I found that, you know, when working small, when I was in juried exhibitions and stuff like that, I didn't get as much attention as uh, at a gallery as let's say, you know, the larger paintings. Right. Have, have you encountered that as well? That in person, when you're in a group show, do you feel that you get as much attention uh, or do you feel that you don't get as much attention as those who work more standard for galleries? You, uh, I get more. It's that, right. that size. Yeah. That size is, is, is hard to ignore in a way, you know, yeah. it's, they have to hang things in, in a more kind of a traditional way. And when you hang a piece that small, you have to give room on either side and automatically it draws people in because there's all that space around it. So they have to go look at it. And then when, fortunately with my stuff, because I, I push a certain amount of realism in it, once they're that close, then you, you, you have them locked in. So that's, that's nice. So, yeah. So I think, I think if I worked bigger, I mean, it, it would have an impact, but not as not like the small ones do. Okay. Kind of cool. Great. Do you yeah. found that it was kind of your niche niche or uh, was, was it that's just something that happened or is it a conscious choice? A little bit of both, I think. Yeah. A little bit of both, you know, you get, you just start getting into it. You know, I, I'm all about, the challenge too. I love when things get screwed up. You know, it's that that chance to you know fight through it and 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 make something happen that really shouldn't have happened in the first place. So uh, a lot of painting small is like that. You know, you it's it's mostly a fight, like all art is. But there's a certain set of challenges when you have to basically defy it's the size that you're working on. You want it to be a good painting, 
but you also want it to be, you know, a certain scale. So when you try to mix those two together, it, it, you know, just makes it a lot of fun to mess around with. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is uh, the fact that working in airbrush, which is inherently for larger scale work. Right. So when you were working small already, when you adopted the airbrush or would, would that, did that come at the same time? They're kind of parallel. So yeah. I didn't work as small as I did once I, you know, when I started in a really tiny stuff, I had already been using the airbrush for a long time. Um, but, uh, but I've always worked small. I think, um, you know, I have small watercolors too from way back. Uh, that yeah. just kind of happened. But again, it's all about the challenge. You know, the challenge to paint on a razor blade with an airbrush is just just kind of got me to do it. You know, yeah. someone said, you know, it's it's not possible. And as soon as someone says that, it's like, okay, I'm gonna try to do that now. So You're throwing down the gauntlet, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's neat with the airbrush. I mean, you know, everyone who's on knows um, it has a you have you can do things with an airbrush that you can't do with a paintbrush on any scale. Yeah. So on a small scale, if you start mixing that with a paintbrush, it gets you can do things that are just impossible to do without it. So that's that's a great thing, you know. It's yeah. it's a lot of fun on that scale. You know, people can't figure out how it's done, and that's a good thing. That's amazing. Now I was looking at your resume, and there was something from the Society of Illustrators. Was that a show yeah. that you had at the Society? Yeah, of Illustrators? yeah. I was a senior in college. Wow. And um, we had um, an illustration project near the end of 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 the the semester, and the 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 uh, the assignment was to basically make something that would translate into a good puzzle. So I had already had my airbrush. I was airbrushing for about a year. I bought it in my junior year, and uh, no sophomore year, end of my sophomore year. Um, so anyway, so we had this project to do, and I was doing everything with the airbrush. They hated it. They didn't really hate it, but. They're like, you need to try something different. But I wanted to learn how to use it. I yes. didn't have anyone really showing me. So in school, they just gave you the, the assignment and you could do whatever you want to, to get that assignment done. Great. So this was a senior project and, um, and we all had the same assignment. My assignment, what I ended up coming up with was this kind of this bowl of cherries. And at the time, again, I was really hooked on all those classic, what order now classic uh, 80s illustrators. So I did these cherries real stylized and they look like they were waxed. And um, and the, the, the piece got into the Society of Illustrators show, which was amazing as a senior in college. So I ended up going to New York. And I was like on 63rd Street, right? Yeah, the big red door. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's it, now I remember seeing the Norman Rockwell paintings there. Yeah. You know, amazing place. Just totally you know, intimidating. Like the Set Lewis Dyke. Yes, exactly. Uh you know, Bob Peak and Mark English and, yes, you know, I know yeah. all those cats, you know, we, yeah. we have the same, same upbringing, basically. So, yeah, it, was an yeah, experience. yeah it must have been great. And I used to go there because, you know, I went to uh, 57th Street, I went to high school, then I went to art school 89th Street. So, okay, so you're right there. So I was always there. But, you yeah. know, it was just, a, and it, you, you saw all the old illustrators hanging out there, right? Oh, yeah. it was, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think you're hot stuff, you know, you think you're really hot <laughs> going in and you walk around and even the other, people, the other students that had artwork there, I knew I was totally outclassed. It was, it was, it was a great eye opening experience. <laughs> That's a hard show to get into. So congratulations. Thanks. I know I haven't gotten in since. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just think, you know, like now all that is like passe in a sense. It's all computers, right? It's all yeah. Photoshop yep. and stuff I don't even like know if that. they still they must still have their annual. I don't know though. I haven't checked in a while. No, and you remember the book that used to come out every year of all that, the yeah, illustrators? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I have mine. Yes, I used to get them every year, you know, and pour over them and be like, Yeah, I wanna paint like this guy, I wanna paint like that oh my guy. God. Yeah. Right? That yeah, was it was amazing. Yeah, I mean it it's really great and so so in the early days, well, not like back in the 1900s, no, like <laughs> <laughs> when the dinosaurs yeah. were in the <laughs> When lettuce was eight cents a head, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, back in the early days, uh, did you feel that the airbrushes weren't as, uh, as refined as they are today? So since you started into today, 
can you see a marked difference or in really the, really hasn't been much in in the actual tool yeah or the, the technology the, of the tool um there there's a lot more airbrushes out now than there were in the 80s um yes. so i think the 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 scale from really bad airbrushes to really good airbrushes is is wider than it was back then yeah um it was hard to find a bad airbrush back then um and all the companies that were out back then were basically building solid brushes pache badger iwata was was there um but now you have like anything you have a bunch of you know really really inexpensive stuff um so so that that i think is the, the biggest difference but as far as technology i mean the airbrush really hasn't changed in over 100 years the, yeah. since it went to an internal mix that's it's been pretty much just how refined can you make it they don't really do anything new with it which is good it means it works so i think that's probably it there's just more junk out there now you know that's the another thing um you know one of the things i was thinking about is you know like I'm sure like what is your average day? How how many hours are you actually spraying with the airbrush on your average work day? So now I try to split it up because if I if I if no one stops me, I'll just paint all day and, and every day. Um so now I try to split it up into three three, three sections. So there's there's airbrushing or doing actual artwork. There's promotion, so anything that has to do with promoting the work, which is, you know, doing the website or the live feed, actually, even though that's painting, is included in that. Uh, and then there's anything admin-related, administration-related, all the stuff no one wants to do. So yes. uh, bookkeeping, plan planning, which is, I mean, I like planning new stuff and coming up with where things are going. So that's included with that. So I find if I divide my time into three, three sections, it works really well. And it's fluid, it, it's not like, you know, Tuesday is promotion day or whatever. I did try to do that, but it, it, it's more fluid now. So I just try to keep conscious on how much time. I keep a work log every day wow. um, of, of what I'm spending time on, especially with the paintings, because again, it can get, I can spend eight hours on a painting and, you know, realize I didn't do anything else. So, yes. uh, so if I keep a work log, I can say, okay, I spent a lot of time on Monday doing this for a certain thing, so I should probably get at some of the other stuff. And it keeps it all going. Do you find that it's much smoother that way? That you know, you days don't get lopsided, and you're able to really feel good about, okay, I did three hours of airbrushing today. I feel good about that because some days, my I know for me, some days I'm shipping, I'm doing other things. Right. And I and I get to the end of the day and it's like I didn't airbrush today or I didn't draw today and I feel upset about that. Yeah, and you have the added you 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 actually have a product or several products. So I don't have that. You know, for me, yes. my products are the art. So if yes. you know, I have to do that. So yeah, yeah, it's it's the only way to keep it straight, you know. It's just yeah, yeah you cuz we all want to do what we want to do and we don't want to do what we don't want to do. So yes. Sometimes you have to force yourself so, so here's here's an interesting question. I asked, you know, those are things like for me, like you had no entanglements whatsoever, and you had one year to to create twenty four paintings, like twenty four knockout paintings. Right. What would get you up in the morning? It's like what kind of paintings? Yeah. What so the one I'm working on, that sort of yeah, thing. The, the the landscape I'm working on right now is is definitely that i i i love when 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 all i do well I, when i wake up i think about that painting wow. and uh sometimes that doesn't happen you know especially as much as i like doing paintings for other people sometimes that it's not the case it's like okay i have to do another painting for someone else but this landscape is is it, i call them hinge paintings for me mm -hmm. so it's a painting where something changes in what i'm doing or i try something new or try to tackle a challenge that's always been going on. So the razor blade paintings are, are, are like that. Um, anything that's really involved, like the, the Manhattan painting, um, this landscape painting is different. The, the motorcycle painting I just finished. Those, those are the things I would work on if there was no, if there was someone waiting with a check book to write whatever check, you know, yes. would, that, that's, that's what I would end up doing. So a hinge painting, would you say that's sort of like a paradigm shift in your artwork? Yeah, like yeah, something happens. Career? Yeah, yeah, 
something happens, you can look back at the paintings you've done. And anyone can do this at, at any skill level, because I can look back when I didn't think my stuff was really that good. And I can see those hinge paintings, like something happened there. I learned how to use freehand templates, for instance. Yeah. I can show you that painting where I, where I learned how to use freehand shields. Um, so those, those paintings are really important. And usually you end up doing those paintings for yourself. That's, yeah. Yeah, it, it's amazing. You know, like I, between like 2002 and 2008, I was really heavily inspired by the late classic Maya. So a yeah. lot of my paintings had hieroglyphs that I actually learned how to how to decipher. I was talking to Mayanists and archaeologists like at Harvard University and everything was going really well. And then one day I woke up and I just stopped doing it. Yeah. And I, I can't tell you why I just stopped doing it. Yeah, yeah. And has something like that happened to you? Um, not like that. Not like yes. that. Um, yeah, that's 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 yeah, that's something that hasn't happened. But that's interesting, and I, I could see why it would, because your your direction changes, and yeah. uh, something else fires you up, and there's not a lot of time for that kind of passion spread out, you know, it seems to be more focused, you know, yes. you, when you have something like that, it's like, oh, I'm just laser focused on that. And that's what I'm going to do. And, and so yes. I could see why you would be able to, you know, drop one and move on to the other. It's, it's interesting because I was working in pastel and, you know, being known as a pastel painter. And one day I woke up and I was like, I want to do airbrush. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. Uh, now as so, so uh, we know about your airbrush art and everything like that. Is there a style or is there a medium that you are not so known for that you do? I used to work a lot in gouache, like watercolor. Okay, um, great. So like I said, I have a couple small, I was doing a lot of small. Um, they, for, for me, the gouache paintings look like watercolors. It's just, I liked building up in layers, which is why I love the airbrush so much. Yeah. Um, so I was using gouache before I was really using the airbrush. And then I use a lot of gouache with the airbrush. Too. Interesting so, to say that. Yeah, because I feel that some of your work does have a gouache feel to it. Yeah, that's that's because I worked so much with it in school for, before I really you know started using the airbrush. And then again, even after. My uncle was a marine combat artist and he was a watercolorist. So that's really how I got into doing watercolors. Ironically, I think if, if, if I couldn't airbrush anymore, I think I would transfer to oil painting now, you know? I think really? I could get the look. Yeah, I think I feel like I get the look that I have with airbrushing with oil painting easier than I could, certainly easier than I could with gouache or watercolor. I don't think I'd be a very successful, you know, watercolorist. It, it's exciting to see, you know, uh, your work, and especially the last, the, the most recent lab, the most recent landscape that you're doing with the wooded forest and the yeah. snow, I really feel like a Andrew Wyeth kind of feel to it. Are you oh, nice. are you uh, are you influenced by Andrew Wyeth? Not directly. Yes. Um, I, I never really got into it him as much as some of the some of the other painters. Um, and again, I was so homed in on on those those illustrators. That, that that's really what I was kind of kind of kind of looking at. Were you blown away by the Apocalypse Now uh, painting uh, by Bob Peake? Because that blew my mind when I was a kid growing up in high yeah, school. Exactly. Yeah, we, it's funny. We were just talking about different different things like that, like album yeah. covers that we remember yeah. specifically now that were just like you know it, it changes you. You know, it's like you don't understand, and that's how I was with my uncle's art. I used to look at him painting and, and not just not understand how it was even possible. Never mind, yeah. you know, that, that, that a human was doing that. So it was wow. pretty, pretty cool that way. So your uncle's art, is there, is it out there on the internet? Can someone go see it? Cause yeah. combat art sounds exciting, you know? Yeah. He was a, he was a Marine combat artist. So he, um, he was, he was in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot and gunner. And wow. then he, um, he retired, but then, so he was brought back in to to just do artwork. So he was uh, he would do a lot of aviation art, which got me into that too. A lot of helicopters from him. So wow. yeah. yeah. So you think that's where you maybe perhaps you got your love for machine? You know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was definitely a big part of it. 
That was definitely a big part because he was a traditional watercolorist, but he would do these tech, you know, technology type paintings that had to be accurate. And to see watercolor pushed in that way, it was really pretty cool. Pretty cool. But on the same note, he would have sections of his painting that were very watercolor like. You know, the the the, the landscapes around that piece of technology were very, very loose and and you know, traditional watercolor type painting. So it was it was a neat thing to see. Wow. And did he, when you know you talked to your uncle, did he tell you some of his his influences? Um, no, he would just rip apart all my artwork on the <laughs> <laughs> he was rough, a rough critic. Oh, he was great. Oh, he was great. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And are there other other artists in your family, creative people? Did you come yeah, from my a creative brother, family? My, yeah, my brother paints. My sister also paints wow. too. Um, my oldest brother is just a musician. He he doesn't paint at all. And my dad was an optical engineer, so he was a draftsman. So. I think I learned a lot of my, you know, really tight technical stuff from watching him do his thing. That's incredible. That's, yeah, he's a good guy. So, so you came from a very creative family. You were just one of many, right? You yes, know? yes, exactly. Wow, that must have been a good experience growing up, right? Yeah, it just made art normal, you know? It's like, it wasn't an anomaly that you did this. You just, you know, everyone did it, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I think it's uh, really fantastic, uh, you know, with the advent of the internet, you know, when we grew up, you know, we didn't have anything like that. So right. when I remember I would, my dad would be up late at night and I would be painting late at night and he would be the first one who would see my art, you know, yep. that yep. would be like posting my art. It's like, dad, what do you think? And oh, yeah. it was really great, you know, to have that kind of uh, honesty from my dad. And I remember one story, I was doing this portrait and, you know, and it had the hand like, you know, visible. And I said, hey, dad, what do you think? And he's like, the hand's too dark. And I was like, no, dad, the hair's not. What are you saying? It's not too dark. I go back in the bedroom and I say, yeah, the hand's too dark. <laughs> <laughs> you never tell him that, though. Right. Oh, no, he, he knew it. So I couldn't oh. even, you know, it was like. Forget it, you know, uh, but the, did you have a lot of that honest criticism growing up that kind of like kept you in line artistically? Brutally honest. Yeah, me and yeah. my brother would have drawing competitions and then we'd run to my mom for her to judge them. And and my brother is older than me, so he, he was he was better than I was. So he would always win. So oh. you know, I would. Uh, yeah, I, I learned how to lose early. Right. That's not fair. Right. You know, it's he's all like, right. It's all right. Made me stronger. Made me stronger. Yes. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so did you, uh, did you, did you study in oils? Um, fortunately not. And I say fortunately because I was on the, when I, when I was accepted into college, I was accepted into a really tiny, a highly specified uh, art school called Swain School of Design. My freshman class was only 30 people. Um, and I went into it as a graphic design major. So my sophomore year, the school was having financial problems, ended up merging with UMass. So we were all able to, to, to kind of choose what we wanted to do as far as our major. So my choice was either, I, was, I knew I didn't want to do graphic design after the first year. So my choice would have been either painting or illustration. So I chose illustration and again, if I had chose painting, I don't think I would have picked up the airbrush for a long time. No, because, you know, the fine art world, which I came from, really has a bad, uh, had a very bad opinion of airbrush, almost like it was one of those taboo relics. Oh, yeah. In it's the South cheap. Pacific. Yeah, you see that. Right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, you say airbrush and, and everyone would stop and look at you. You couldn't even right. say a word. That's how right. bad it was. You know? Right. It's a, it, it's a medium to everyone else. It's not a tool. And I'm like, it's not a medium. Oils are a medium and watercolor is a medium. Yes. Airbrush is a tool. No one's no one's a, a, a paintbrush painter, you know, yeah. or well, a palette knife painter. Yeah, I'm a filbert painter, you know. Exactly. <laughs> the Silver Painters Association of America. I'm a card holding member. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot of that. Not so much now. I think now is much better. 
Oh, yes, it is getting better because, you know, number one there, the, the art education is changing, right? Yeah. It's more workshop based and, uh, right. you know, the, the whole idea of like going to four years of art school really, you know, especially now with COVID-19, that really is kind of like becoming extinct. And I feel very happy to have that experience, but I don't know right. if, if that's going to be available five years from now. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I hope Me so. Too. Me too. Yeah. But I, I definitely see a shift in in things, uh, you know, going online and, and stuff like that. And the yeah. whole art school situation is kind of going away. Uh, do yeah. you do you agree with that? Or you uh, disagree with that? I haven't I haven't kept up on really what's going on. You know, I, I grew up like like, well, of course, New York is New York, but I grew up only about 30 minutes from RISD. My sister went to RISD. Wow. So for me, it's the same thing. It, art, art is, it, it's never, you know, that, that degree is never going away. You know, there'll always be something, but I could be wrong. Yes. Plus my kids are now adults and I'm out of the whole, you know, college thing anyway. So, um, yeah, so I don't pay as much attention to what's happening that way. But I do have some friends who have younger kids and I know, you know, that they're, that they're into art and they're going in for art history or, or art restoration or that kind of thing. So hopefully it's, it's still gonna, you know, be a, a real thing. Yeah, now, now Rizzy, for those who don't know, is Rhode Island School of Design. Right. And, uh, you know, the big schools, you know, you have Parsons, yeah. uh, Pratt, Rhode Island School of Design, School of Visual Arts, yep. uh, Fashion Institute Technology, uh, Savannah School of Art and Design. Uh, so those like were the big ones. Right. And they offer, uh, you know, a lot of different programs and everything like that. But I, I kind of, for me, I kind of feel like that is kind of going away because the whole idea of a college degree is going away. Oh, if, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. And I, I, but I think it's a good and bad thing. You know, it's, you know, the idea of sticking through art school or sticking through college kind of weeds out those who aren't serious, right? Yeah. If nothing, yeah. else, it just weeds it out. So it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing, right? You right, know, right. a piece of paper shouldn't really make a big difference. The art should, right? Or agree. Oh, agree. agree. Yeah. Unless you're a surgeon. <laughs> yeah, 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 you don't want that. And then for, for me, I mean, when I look back at, you know, the four years that I spent at art school, it, it, what had, in the end of it, it had nothing to do with teaching me actually how to do art. What it did at the time for me was it took this high school kid and taught him how to really respect it. All of a sudden, when I was in school, now I realize that this is a career. You know, this is this is a real thing. Yes. So I think that's that's when I look back at my my college experience. That was it. You know. Right. Right. Yes. And I and that's true. You know, you you know, showing up every day and you know exactly. getting those grades. It wasn't just like. I don't feel like it today, right? No, you, and, and and the critiques of your work, you know, I'd never had, you know, a group of 30 other people looking at my work and telling me what's wrong with it. You know, that was great in hindsight. Yes, yes. And, you know, that's their job to tell you and be honest, right? Exactly. And, uh, exactly. you know, and one of the things I learned is that you can't defend your work once you put it out there. The only time right. you can defend it is at the easel. So yes. once it's out there, it's like, okay, you got to take your lumps. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I learned too, right? Um, yeah. And you get a thicker skin on the whole thing. You know, if someone says they don't like your painting, you don't curl up in a corner and, you know, throw away your paints. It's just, it's, it's, it's a good lesson to learn, you know, that everyone yeah. has their opinion and, and you just roll on. Quick story. I, I remember I was uh, at the National Academy School of Fine Arts and we were, we were painting from the model. And I really feel that I did the best hand of my life. I mean, this hand was like- Wasn't too dark? It wasn't too dark, no. It, it was just like, really, to me, I was so happy with this hand. You know, I would go to the mat and I would look at David and how oh, he yeah. did his hand, right? And then I, and I, and then I remember it was a summer class and it was with Ron Schur. And I remember, in, and they walk around the class and they critique your work as they go at different yep. stages. So he took a rag and put turpentine and wiped out the whole hand. Oh. And he said 
That was a beautiful hand, but too bad it was too small for the body. Oh. And he was right. But, you know, I was like 18 years old. And I'll tell you, you know, that was like, I remember going off somewhere and crying <laughs> because literally when you put your whole heart and soul into something, yep. and like you say, it gives you that thick skin that you probably wouldn't get anywhere else because right. they can go ahead and wipe it because they have to make a point that you can't get away with the proportion being too small, but everything else being okay. Right. And, right. Uh, and I, one time I was in the elevator and I did this real beautiful portrait. I was so happy with I was like 19 years old. Everyone was like, Tim, that's really good. I love it. And then uh, one of the teachers comes in and says, yeah, too bad you don't have any room for the cranial mass, you know, <laughs> like, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, the hair was like flat and it didn't have enough room for the rest of the, the, the skull. I was like, he was in a, he was in a biking accident. It, it yeah. You know, but it, it was just rough, you know, it's, right. it's just that rough, those rough critiques that we go through. So I have but a quick, those were better then than it is now. I mean, with the internet and the, 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 you know, the faceless people that will troll someone's artwork on some of these sites just to be, just to be a, you know, a jerk is, I mean, it's brutal. It's brutal. So yeah. at least we had someone who was actually trying to make us better. And they did. I really did. They, yeah. they did make us better because we don't forget it. You know, no matter yeah. how long we live, we're not going to forget those times. No, um, no, you're right. Right. One of the things about your artwork and that I really love and, you know, one of the examples would be, let me go back to sharing the screen here, uh, right here. So this painting right here. So you see this painting, uh, this one right here. Yes. The colors. Now, you know why I like this painting and, why I think a lot of people love this painting is that you have blues throughout, but you do have distinct blues. Yes. And blue is one of the hardest color to actually make a distinction. I feel it's one of the hardest colors to get the shades and everything. Um, so I know a lot of people ask me that. So let's say you have a color, right? Yep. You're painting and you want to go ahead and you want to hit, that blue of the water. Now, not the dark or the light, but let's say the, you know, the local color of that. Yep. What would be your method? Would you start out with a base color and then work from there? How would you do that, sir? Yeah, one of the, one of the, I don't know where I picked it up from, but um, working on a colored ground changed so much for me. Um, I, I would, I would always, I can, and the same thing, I can look back at my old work and I could see that I did everything on white illustration board yes but breaking away and working on a colored ground and i don't have to tell you this because of the you know the, the amazing ink paintings you do on the, the color line paper thank you sir once you get that that kind of once you break the seal essentially once you put something down and you either have to fight to get it back to where you want or 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 add to it to to make it the way you want that changed a lot so for me when i do these paintings i'll block them in now so there'll be a really light blue to start off with that and then from there then i'll i'll decide whether it has to be cooler or warmer or if it you know needs to be pushed in a certain way but uh but that base color is on there so probably the the if you go up maybe about um, a half an inch from the horizon, that's probably the base color for that sky. And then oh, everything wow. else is added on after. Wow. So you dip, do you kind of like squint your eyes? Uh, or some people say they squint their eyes. If they wear glasses, they take them off to get that local color. What's your technique of finding that local color that you start out with? Well, I'm blind. So with all my glasses, <laughs> that's like squinting. So it's <laughs> Oh, that works out great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, I, I use I use the Createx colors, the Wicked colors, and um, they have they have a great lineup of colors, and I've become really comfortable with them. So yes. when I grab a blue, 
for instance, like the cobalt blue tends to be a lot cooler than just their standard blue. So yeah. knowing that, I kind of before I start, I get in my head like kind of what I'm, I'm 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 shooting at, and then that'll help me get that local color to start. And then wow. from there, it's just a matter of kind of pushing it around. But that one, that painting is actually more than the color. That entire painting, and you'll appreciate this: the entire painting is set up with the golden ratio. The oh man, that is fantastic! From yes, stem to stern, every. Every bit of that painting is within the golden ratio. If you look at the clouds, they, the clouds are only in uh, the square at the top. It's a perfect square. Wow. So the ratio between the sky and the ground, like the, if you follow the, the right-hand side down, that's, yeah. that, that ratio is a golden ratio. The horizon line where the, where the land goes across, so where the land stops and then continues on with the water, that's also in the golden ratio. The size of the rectangle of the panel is the golden ratio too. So, and if you put the spiral on it, if you you know, the spiral, the very center of the spiral ends where that little walkway is. Have you read the book by Mario Olivio? No, oh, not yet. Oh my God, you have to read. You have to. Is it is it pro ratio or? Oh, it's it just will make you want to do more golden ratio everywhere. <laughs> oh, that's cool. right. And he just talks about where it's in a pineapple, where it's oh, in the yeah. branches of the tree, where it's in the digits of your finger. You know, everywhere the golden ratio two point uh, two to three is just everywhere. You know, it's amazing, right? Right. Yes, and. Uh, so I definitely can appreciate that. Once you said the golden ratio, a lot of my my influence piece had all to do with the golden ratio. Yep. And uh, so just just amazing that you did that. The thing about the golden ratio when you do it, you know, when you say it to most people, yeah, I use the golden golden ratio. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's like that's like the sauce you get without your chicken nuggets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So one of the things that, you know, we have as artists is called approach avoidance, right? You have, and now for me, I'll have approach avoidance, like in the last painting I did where there was a wool jacket, right? Normally right. I'd be like, oh no, we're just going to, we're just going to make her have a dark jacket. I'm just not going to approach it. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but looking at your work, right? And I definitely can say beyond a shadow of doubt, that you don't have that approach avoidance. At least I don't see it. I mean, the last thing you did uh, with the uh, the gas tank, the red gas yeah. tank, just like, holy cow, right? Just, just amazing. And That's a good example of that, though. You know, I looked at that and I was like, how the heck am I going to do this? So that's, yes. that's a great example. That tank was, was a good example of that. Now, where would I find that so other people can see it here? Can I haven't get... got that up on anything yet. Um, I'm oh. in the middle of varnishing that right now. As soon as it's varnished, then I'll, I'll get it up on the site. Yeah, I mean, if people go to my Facebook page or my Instagram page, it, it was all over both of those. Yes, just and it's on the thumbnail of this particular video. So, yeah, oh, good, yeah. So you, you, you. You don't, you know, and I really see that you go for things that most people be like, uh, they, I'm not messing with this, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what made you do that? You know, as a young artist, right? You know, you're starting out, you're like, I want to paint Chrome with lots of reflections. Right. I mean, that's like the last thing that we sort of go towards, but what made you be so brave? It's all about standing out. You know, the whole thing about being an artist is trying to do something that, and you can't do something that no one's ever done, it seems like. It seems like everything's been done. But you you, you try to you, you try to do things that aren't as common. And yeah. the, usually the things that aren't as common are the things that no one wants to do. So it's a it's it's a kind of a good way to aim at it, you know. Okay. Uh, just great advice, you know, just if you want to stand out, you do things you might be afraid of, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes, that that's great advice. Advice that you would give to someone starting out. Miss say I'm not saying a complete newbie. I would say maybe six months to a year in. What would you tell them? Um, artistic wise or business wise or all of the uh, above? 
Let's do the artistic wise first, a two part question. Okay. I think artistic wise, we talked a little bit about it, having that thick skin, it's, it, it's always a balance between being confident in what you're doing, but being able to listen to what people say, good or bad, even the, the trolls that are out there. Yeah. To be able to listen to people and be able to filter that and yes. not be overly emotional about about sure. your work. And then it, it, the, something that goes along strongly with that is you have to look at everyone else's artwork, but you can't judge your artwork against someone else, especially someone who's been doing it for a lot longer. Yes. It's a dangerous thing because we're all on, we're all on the same path. It's just people are at different different spots of that path. So if you get into judging yourself against someone else, you're never going to feel good about what you're doing. So take Funny that with a I could add on to that. If I'm looking at an artist like too much, like let's say I'm looking at Rossetti's work, like I'm really into Rossetti. I'm reading a book on Rossetti. His work will actually creep into my work. Or right. no, I wouldn't say creep, wrong word, but. No, I know what you mean. It would just sort of blend in. Right. So, you know, and I try not to do that because I, I want to stay on my own path. I don't want to be overly influenced by anybody. Is that part of it? Like you can look at other people's work, but but make sure that you realize it's over there. It shouldn't get into your head either oh, way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because there's nothing wrong with looking at the strengths of another artist that you really admire. And if those strengths are your weaknesses to try to figure out what they're doing and incorporate and into what you're doing, but your art is still your art, you know? I mean, yes. it's, it should be, it should, everything is filtered through what, you know, what we do. So you just gotta keep that in mind. Fun question. So let's yes. say the airbrush came out at uh, 1600, 1620, it was invented oh by Lewandyke, right? Do you feel artists such as Johannes Vermeer, Rembrandt, you feel that these guys would have been like, yeah, let me let me let me add it. What do you think? I think the ones with with guts would have, but I think the ones that were, um, the 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 ones that were locked into their type of painting probably wouldn't have, even if they thought it would be an advantage. So Da Vinci would have because it's a tool, and he was he he, he probably already invented it. We just don't know it yet. True. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they say the first airbrush was like a bone in, in the caves, right? Yep. Where yep. they, they haul out a bone and blue pigment onto the wall. So yep. the cave they, paintings in uh, Alaska, right? In, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, it's been great. So we're almost at an hour. So I awesome. just, uh, you know, thanks, Steve. I really appreciate your time. I mean, this oh, was my really pleasure, Tim really fantastic i mean i learned a lot and i hope other people learned a lot i don't think you learned anything but that's okay oh, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> well i just want to uh uh you know tell everybody at 6 30 on your facebook right and what's yes. your facebook name where they it's, can go uh, ahead it's stephen Leahy art Stephen Leahy Art and your your website, if I'm not mistaken, is Steve uh, no StephenLeahy.com, correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yep. here I think this is the one. Let's see. And uh all the links are on my website. So Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, those links are on the website if you you oh, know it makes it easy. Great, so. fantastic. So what's 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 the painting on the easel before I let you go? So that's that landscape right now. And yes. um, I'm working on a painting for Mr. Mummery, which is very exciting. Yes. Um, so that's that's good because there's a there's a video that's gonna go with that painting, which which I've never done before. So with Brad's painting, um, and it was actually Brad's idea, I'm videoing the entire painting from beginning to end. So you'll wow. it's it's gonna be about ten to twelve hours when it's done and you'll be able to kind of hang out and watch the whole thing. Wow, that's amazing. That's going to be really cool. So, who ever thought back, you know, back in the 80s you'd be videotaping your 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 painting from beginning to end. That was not me. <laughs> I did not. 
Well, Steve, I just thank you so much. I hope you have a, a great rest of the week. And you, uh, you got snow coming, huh? Because we have snow yeah. coming tomorrow. Yeah, it's been snowing nonstop. And Tim, before before I let you go, um, I do want to thank you because you talk about hinge stuff and things have changed. So when I started watching your your channel and your videos and decided way back, I think it was the middle January or March of last year to to order those inks and try them. That yeah. was such a blast because it was such a departure from the way I normally worked. I went oh. from you know using all the color, the opaque paints to these transparent ink paints or inks that reminded me of when I first started airbrushing. But I had a lot more experience now, and yes. again, watching the way that they came kind of kind of came together, they're it, it's it's just a blast to use. So I want to yeah. thank you for that. You know, there's all those series of three eight by four inch paintings. Those are all because of you. So I really want to thank you for uh, introducing me to that and showing me what's up. Well, it's an honor that you use my inks. Definitely. I mean, that makes me feel good. You know, uh, makes me feel great. By the way, and That's you blessed. know watching what you're doing pushes me and like, like going all the way back down to art school, you know, in a full circle, you know, you have your fellow artists and, you know, they do something and they push you to do that and you that's do something always. and they yep. push. And, and I think that's what I feel about the airbrush community as a whole. Yes. A lot we're of all like people. that. We're all Absolutely. pushing each other, right? We're all like, yep. Hey, who's this new guy? What's he doing? That's really cool. I want to try that, right? Yeah, and then we just make fun of the people we don't like, and it works out great. Yeah, you know, you make fun of them. Usually I do it in Spanish, and I have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 All right, so. uh, take care, sir. It was always a pleasure. My pleasure, Tim. Bye, sir. Hey, guys. So uh, it was a, it, this was great. Thank you so much for hanging out today. Uh, we learned a lot from Mr. Leahy, and so I really, really appreciate everyone coming and and uh, learning from one of the great American artists right now. And uh, it's it's so fantastic the airbrush world, the airbrush community is. I think there is pretty much where some of the art, the artists and artwork that I feel is going to be the artwork and the artists that are going to be talked about from centuries to come. I know it's a bold statement, but I really feel that the best art today is being done in the airbrush community. So thank you so much. I want to let you know that if you want to go ahead and hit that subscribe button, because I'm going to have interviews with artists from all over, uh, airbrush artists from all over. And that's going to be exciting. So if you hit the, you subscribe and hit that little bell icon, you'll basically be alerted when new videos like this and new interviews. And also I do a demonstration of my India inks in airbrush every other Wednesday at the same time, 9.30, usually 9.30 to 11.30. So... Take care, guys. Always a pleasure. I'll see you next week for part four of Painting the Irish Last in India Ink and Airbrush. Take care, everybody.